I think sometimes we just have to learn how to say no to a lot of things in our life. And, uh, and I, don't think, I don't think there's anything dumb about that at all. Uh, I, um, I used to pastor a very large church, had a pretty good sized staff, and a lot of church members, more than I could count. And um, people were always tugging and pulling me, wanting to do this and wanting to do that, and, and we need this and we need that. And so I'd get up in the morning and just look in the mirror and say, no, 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 just to get in practice because I knew I was going to have to say it a hundred times that day if I had to say it once uh, because I had to keep the budget in check and just not let people go on spending frenzy all the time. And so uh, they, they laughed at me about that. They said, they, here comes Pastor No again. And, um, but uh, sometimes you have to know when to say no, don't you? And uh, we find a case like that over in the book of Genesis 39. Here's a young man that knew when to say no. Uh, the scripture says there is none greater uh, in this house than I. This is Joseph talking. And he's down there in Egypt, you know. He's been brought into the king's house, Potiphar's house. And uh, his wife has tried to seduce him. And so this is his response to that. He says, there is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he, talking about her husband, kept back anything from me but thee. In other words, uh, this king had given uh, uh, him full charge of everything in that kingdom, and really the only thing that king had in reserve for himself was his own wife, which uh, he certainly should keep her in reserve, shouldn't he? And he says, because thou art his wife, then how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, it was a sin against himself. It was a sin against his uh, uh, king. It was also a sin against God. And he recognized this is something so important that I ought to say no about this. There are just some things for which you ought to say no. I read a story one time about William Booth. You know, William Booth was a founder of the uh, Salvation Army. He was born in England back in 1829. And William Booth associated uh, with the Wesleys, uh, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, and, uh, and, and of course, they were the founders. Uh, and by the way, the Wesleys didn't set out to found a church. Uh, that just happened, and uh, they didn't pick the name Methodist. Uh, they were just so methodical in everything they did that people called them Methodists. They got up at a certain hour every morning, read the scriptures so much, so much time each day, and they just had a method about what they did, so people uh, just gave them that name uh, Methodist. And of course, I was raised a Methodist, and uh, my wife says I'm still a Methodist uh, because when you look in my closet, I have all my white shirts on white hangers, my blue shirts on blue hangers, and they are ranged from colors from light to darkest and, and all that kind of stuff. And she said, you're just Methodist through and through, aren't you? You just <laughs> got to have a me my My brother-in-law comes over and he just laughs at me because in my garage, I have all these shelving units and I have these little bitty boxes and I have, I have labels on those boxes and those labels are in alphabetical order. And now people laugh at me, but if you come to my house and say you need something, I can find it just like that. I don't have to go rummaging around and digging through a bunch of trunks trying to figure out where stuff is. And so sometimes it's good to be a Methodist, although I'm not Methodist in doctrine today, but I'm still methodical in the way I live. But anyway, William Booth associated with John Wesley and Charles Wesley and uh, was part of the Methodist church. Now, uh, as he went about preaching, he preached down in the slums. Uh, he organized what they called Hallelujah Bands, and, uh, and uh, he got put in jail uh, for some of the stuff he did. But the biggest crisis in his life did not come uh, there. The, the biggest crisis came from his church. He was a part of the Methodist Church. And one of the tenets of the Methodist Church is that when you become a minister in the Methodist Church, you have to agree that you will go and minister wherever they tell you to go. Uh, you know, and so once a year, the Methodists have an annual conference, and the bishops there, the district superintendents are there, and they do what they call the appointments. And uh, eh, it's a little political today, and things have changed a lot. But there was a time when I was a boy. I remember this when preachers went to conference. They had no idea. They just knew they'd better have their bags ready to pack at home because they could be moved, and they could be moved anywhere. So, but the Methodists, that was part of the thing that you have to go. Where they tell you to go? Well, the Methodist Conference met, and they're telling William Booth where he has to go, and he doesn't want to go there. He wants to go into the slums. He wants to go where people are hurting. He wants to go where he can have a viable ministry with people who really need Christ, and they would not send him there. And so they brought charges against him. They're going to censure him now in the Methodist Church, 
And so this conference is going on, and Mrs. Booth is sitting up in the balcony, and uh, they're putting the pressure on William to accept this appointment. And Ms. Booth rips out this white hanky, and she's waving it in the air, and she's saying, Say no, William! Say no! And he said no that day, and then she came down out of that balcony, and they locked arm in arm and walked out the door. You know the rest of the story. They founded the Salvation Army, had a ministry that went around the world and is still effective even to the day. But sometimes we just have to say no. And, uh, and so that's an important thing. You know, Daniel had three companions that went with him down there uh, to uh, uh, Babylonium, and uh, uh, they were uh, children of Judah who had been brought to Babylonium by ne ne uh, Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and they were brought there for specific reasons. They weren't just brought there because they were slaves. They weren't just brought there because they wanted to bring people. But these were the choice young men uh, in Israel and uh, brilliant minds, and, uh, and they wanted to groom them and use them uh, because they wanted to maintain control of all of these uh, slaves that they had brought in. And so they needed, uh, they needed someone who understands the culture and the background, the language, and all of that. And so they picked these young men to groom and train for this work. And uh, Daniel, by the way, Daniel's uh, name means God is my judge. Well, uh, when he got there, of course, one of the things you do uh, when you want to break somebody down, uh, you have to uh, destroy their identity. And uh, if you can get rid of their identity, then you can start breaking down the other ties that they have. So the first thing he did, we're going to change all your guys' names. And so Daniel's name meant uh, God is my judge. Well, they named him Belshazzar, which meant the prince of Baal. See, so he's now not identified with the God of the universe, but he's identified with an idol god. Uh, the god Baal. And then Hananiah, his name meant God is gracious, and they changed his name. You know it more by Shadrach. And, uh, of course, Shadrach is, uh, is his Babylonian name. And Shadrach means inspired of rock, R-O-C-H, which is the name of a false god. Again, uh, removing his identity from the true and living God, uh, changing his identity to that of a false god. And then Michelle uh, means godlike, and he was renamed Meshach, uh, which means who is like Aku, and of course Aku is another a name associated with a false god. And then Azariah, his name meant godlike, and he was renamed Abednego, uh, which meant servant of the fire god. So this was the beginning of the process now to brainwash these boys, uh, change their names, change their identities, try to cut them off from all of the past, get them away from all of that belief system that they had. Pretty much the same system we have today in the United States when we send our kids off to the state universities. Uh, they pretty much try to uh, change their identities and draw them away from, uh, from all their faith. But so this is, this is the process. They're trying to uh, brainwash these boys. So we, we know a little bit more about these three friends of Daniel because there came a point in time when Nebuchadnezzar built this golden image, and he said, now everybody has to bow down. It's an image of him, by the way. And says, I want everybody to bow down and worship me. And uh, these uh, three boys, they said, we, we're not going to do that because we can't bow down to any but the true and the living God. And uh, he got very angry about that. And he, and he said, well, look, uh, we'll give you another shot at it. But if you don't, uh, we're going to put you in a fiery furnace. We're going to put you to death uh, for not doing that. And you know what they said? They said no. They said no. You know, there's sometimes when you have to know how to say no. And, of course, you know the story. Uh, he, he got incensed. He had them uh, fire up the furnace hotter than it had ever been before. And actually the men who took them to throw them in the furnace perished from the heat on the outside of the furnace. But those three boys went into the furnace and came out without a hair on their head scorched and not even the smell of smoke upon their body. But while they were in the furnace... The king looked inside and he said, I thought we put three in there. I see one, the fourth, and he is like unto the Son of God. Let me tell you something. It paid for them to say no, didn't it? Amen. Now, they didn't know it was going to pay for them to say no because before they went into the fiery furnace, they said this. They said, our God is able to deliver us, but if not, they were still going to say no. And that's the mindset that we need to have. You know, we, we, we don't need people to be yes people only when things are working out well. Uh, we, we need to be able to say no when things are not going to work out well, you see. And so then we have this story about Daniel. Uh, uh, right off the bat, he refused to eat the king's meat, drink the king's wine, you know. 
And uh, boy, that uh, created quite a stir. But everything worked out pretty well, didn't it? Uh, they, this fellow let him do it, and uh, he kept watching him and watched me. He says, well, you know, he looks pretty good. Uh, his color's good. His health's good. And uh, he's faring just well uh, without doing this. And so Daniel uh, progressed, and eventually Daniel said no, but eventually he came to the place. Guess what? He became head over it all. I mean, he was just given tremendous authority in that land. It paid to say no. Well, Jesus, of course, is the great example, isn't he? We come to the New Testament, we find that time when Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and the Bible says, and afterwards he was hungry. I guess so. You try not eating for 40 days and 40 nights and see if you're not hungry. I'll guarantee you will be. And Satan came to him in Matthew 4, 4, and uh, he, he uh, began to tempt him. And he says, uh, uh, you know, you could turn these stones into bread. You can have plenty to eat here, not a problem. And Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus saying no to that temptation. And he gives him a scriptural reason for the no that he gives him. And then in verse 5, uh, the devil taketh him to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. In verse 6 it says, And he said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give the angel, his angels charge concerning thee, and, their, uh, and, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And against Jesus answered him there in verse 7. He said, It is written again. Now, there's an important lesson for us here. Jesus had to know what was written in order to say what was written. And, 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 and so, and, and we, have that same, we have that same tool right here. We have the Word of God. And, and the reason that we succumb to temptations oftentimes is because we don't have the, it is written. But if we, if we hide the Word of God in our minds and in our hearts, and when Satan comes to us to tempt us, we say, wait a minute. I think I remember reading back there in the Word of God that I can't do that. It is written. And so that's what he did. And, and so we have that same thing available to us. Uh, we can, we can uh, fight Satan the same way. He says, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord uh, thy God. And then Satan came to him again. And he says, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said again, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. Jesus said, No, no, no. We need to practice saying no. There are just some things that we ought to say no to. You know, we live in a society today that says, Oh, we ought to be tolerant, accepting of everything. No, we don't. There are some things that we should not accept, never accept. We should say no. I don't know about you, but I have never regretted the times that I've said no to Satan. Have I always said no to him? No. But I've sure regretted it when I didn't. Isn't that true? I look back over, I look back over my entire lifespan, all the way back to when I was a little boy, and the most regretful moments all through my life were the times when I yielded to temp. And the greatest joys, as I look over 72, almost 72 years of living, the greatest joys have been the victory moments when I said no to Satan. 